Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first lecturer this year, Nomi Stoltenberg. Nomi is a, a very distinguished professor of law and religion, a leader in the law and humanities um, discipline of law teaching. She's at uh, USC. She was on the Harvard Law Review with me many years ago. Um, and she and her husband David have written a blockbuster book that she's going to tell some stories about tonight. And without any further ado, Naomi, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Can everybody hear me? Great. So let me begin by expressing my thanks, first of all, to Naoshi Giles for organizing this event, to Zach Ziswick for technical assistance, to my students, um, who I'm delighted to see here, and I'm even more delighted to be able to talk to over the course of the semester about some of the issues I'm gonna talk with you all about today. And I especially wanna thank my former law school classmate, kind of Lori Gearpart, <coughs> Professor Tom Baker, for inviting me to be the, the Bruce professor this year. I particularly want to thank the Bruce family for endowing this visiting professorship and annual lecture series. I'm really deeply honored to be this year's Bruce visiting professor of Talmudic civil law. Um, although, I have to confess, I am neither a professor nor a scholar of Talmudic law, civil, or otherwise. I am rather, as Tom said, a scholar of American law, with a particular focus on law and religion. And what I want to talk with you about today is the fascinating story of a group of Hasidic Jews based in New York who set out to create a community where they could live a life of strict adherence to Jewish law, or to use the Hebrew term halacha, which literally means the way, but which refers specifically to the corpus of laws and ordinances embodied in the Talmud and other Jewish legal texts that have traditionally guided Jewish ritual life, but also Jewish daily behavior. This works. There we go. The community that I'm referring to is a legally recognized municipality in Orange County, New York, known as the Village of Curious Joel, which is populated exclusively by members of the Hasidic group known as the Sotmers, and is the subject of the book, whose cover is pictured here, um, which I co-wrote with David Myers, the title of which, as you can see here, is American Stelle, the making of Curious Joel, a Hasidic village in upstate New York. And in this talk, I want to, if not answer, address two questions. Why American and why Stelle? So Stelle is the term that was bestowed on the community by its founder, that's him, Rabbi Joel Teitelman. <coughs> Born in 1887 in an area of East Central Europe, which shifted back and forth between Hungarian and Romanian control, Reb Yoilish, as he was known, was scion of one of the most renowned and, in some circles, notorious Hasidic families. He stands today as one of the leading figures of Haredi, or ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Even though his was the last of the Hasidic groups to be formed, before the Holocaust entirely wiped out the world of Ashkenazic Jewry, from which his Hasidic group and other Hasidic groups emerged. Well before that catastrophic event, Reb Yoilish was deeply committed to a project of cultural preservation and religious restoration, which he described as following the path of ancient Israel and upholding the purity and sanctity of the Torah. He fiercely opposed all forms of innovation, including those that were being introduced by other, what he regarded as more lenient forms of Orthodox Judaism. But he reserved his most ferocious criticism for Zionism, 
which he famously described as the worst form of spiritual pollution the world had ever seen, um, maintaining later that the Holocaust was divine punishment for Jewish support for Zionism. Uh, ironically, he was saved himself from the ravages of the Holocaust by a Hungarian Zionist official, but that is a story, a very interesting story for another day. His community of followers had only existed for a short while before the 1944 Nazi invasion. It was in 1928 that Teitelbaum was first elected town rabbi in what was then the Romanian town of Satu Mare, known in <coughs> Hungarian as Satmar, whence the Satmar Kassinen take their name. Because so many of the town's Jews had opposed his appointment, in no small part because they objected to his reputation for extreme stringency, he was actually encouraged to stay away from Satumari for six years. He only returned in 1934 and thus only had 10 years to build up his community in Satmar, Satumari, before Nazi German forces invaded Hungary on March 19, 1940. Following the war, after a brief sojourn, ironically enough, in Palestine, Teitelbaum arrived in the United States, settling in 1946 in the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn. It was there, at the very moment that earlier generations of Jewish immigrants, my family, were leaving Brooklyn, that the Sommer Rebbe began to build up a community anew out of the tattered fragments of Hungarian Jewry and other Holocaust survivors. His community of followers in Brooklyn quickly grew into a stronghold of ultra-Orthodox or Haredi Judaism. But from his earliest days in America, Teitelbaum expressed not just his desire, but his belief in the necessity of establishing an enclave outside the city where the Sommers could pursue their way of life free from the intrusions and contaminants of the outside world. He referred to the insular community he aspired to create as four pure cubits, or more commonly, as a shtetl, a term that harked back to the small and medium-sized towns in Europe whence many American Jews came, shtetl being a Yiddish word that literally means town, but which had come to convey the traditional way of life that pre-World War II Jewish immigrants had left behind and that the post-war immigrants had witnessed being destroyed. <coughs> Otherwise put, Rev. Eilish's vision was the mythologized version of the shtetl, which was in many ways very much at odds with the actual shtetls that had existed in Eastern Europe before the war. The actual historical shtetl was oftentimes a neighborhood, occasionally a larger portion of the town, in which Jews lived, clustered together, but side by side with non-Jews. Satumare, for example, was a small East Central European city, a multilingual, multi-ethnic, multicultural city with a population of 50,000, of which about 15,000 were Jews. In some towns, Jews might represent a considerable plurality or even a majority within a larger area that included non-Jews as well, but there were no towns exclusively populated by Jews, certainly no place where Jews controlled the local government, let alone had their own local government, though Jewish communities were granted limited grants of jurisdiction over certain matters such as marriage and divorce. In addition to living in towns with non-Jewish residents, there was a great deal of religious and ideological heterogeneity within the Jewish communities of the shtetl. Not everybody was traditionally observant, and among those who were, there was a variety of forms of traditional observance. Just as not everyone followed the same Rebbe, not everyone belonged to the same political party, in short, there was a tremendous amount of religious and cultural diversity within the East, Eastern European shtetl. By contrast,
1930s as Hitler was rising to power. So we, my understanding is that um, from time to time, uh, the powers that be that are monitoring the CLE program will take over the machinery. So thank you. We're back. Um, so you all recognize this image, right? Um, this is to make the point that it is not only Jews who subscribe to this mythologized image of the shtetl. As captured by Fiddler on the Roof, the wildly popular Broadway musical, which opened in 1964 and attained an even bigger audience when the film version was released in 1971. The idealized image of the shtetl as a holistic community bound by tradition until it was disrupted by hostile forces was eagerly adopted by non-Jews as well. This celebration of roots was a trend that cut across the political spectrum and across religious, cultural, and racial dividing lines in the 1970s as well. It arguably began with the Black Power Movement and with more popularized versions of Black cultural pride epitomized by Alex Haley's blockbuster book, um, which then became the TV miniseries, Roots. And it continued with the proliferation of expressions of white ethnic pride, some of which, as described by Matthew Fry Jacobson in his book, Roots II, were clearly a strategy for maintaining white supremacy in the face of black nationalism, as well as more liberal civil rights projects. Others were more anodyne, and still others expressed solidarity with the black struggle for political empowerment, or gave voice to the struggles of other oppressed groups against the cultural hegemony of the Protestant establishment that still appeared to dominate American cultural and political life. One of the most interesting manifestations of this early 70s longing to restore a traditional way of life and return to roots is this little known speech by Justice Lewis Powell, which attests to the role the mythic image of the shtetl was coming to play not just in the Jewish political imagination, but in the American political imagination as well. In addition to being a Supreme Court justice, Powell is best known for his role in formulating the so-called Powell Memo, uh, which you see a, a portion of which here, uh, titled Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Derided by critics as a quote, corporate blueprint to dominate democracy <clears throat> and championed by anti-communists, anti-New Dealers, and Powell himself as a defense of the American free enterprise system. The memorandum was commissioned by the United States Chamber of Commerce in 1971, shortly before, very shortly before Powell was appointed by Nixon to the Supreme Court. It is viewed by supporters and critics alike as having laid out a blueprint for the American conservative political movement going forward. Much less well known is what I think of as the other Powell memo, um, actually a speech uh, delivered in the form of the prayer breakfast address that Powell delivered just one year later, that's on the other side here, um, to what is described as a congregation of lawyers and their families who had gathered in San Francisco for the American Bar Association meeting just after Powell finished his first term on the Supreme Court. In this speech, Justice Powell lamented the loss of traditional values and respect for traditional forms of authority. And fascinatingly, he invoked the portrayal of the village of Anatevka in Filler on the Roof to convey quote, the sense of belonging that he saw as being under attack by revolutionary forces, just as he had written the, the previous year about how the system of private enterprise was under attack by liberal and left-wing forces. Conjuring up, and these are his words, the picture of Tevye, the father, the patriarch, blessing his family, 
Powell's prayer breakfast address is notable for a number of reasons, not least because it shows the confluence of the business wing and the religious wing of what was then a, a somewhat newly ascendant conservative movement. Against the commonplace view that these are separate elements with distinct and even conflicting agendas, this talk is a vivid illustration of the coexistence of social conservatism with the political forces promoting the deregulation of the market. And together, they form an important part of the backdrop to the Sotmer's effort to first establish a shtetl in the suburbs and then subsequently defend it from attacks upon it. That said, I want to emphasize the growing power of the conservative political movement in the 1970s was hardly the only political force responsible for the changes in political conditions, in cultural outlook, and importantly, in the interpretation of the First Amendment that would make America so conducive to the Sotmer separatist project. Support for religious minorities, including separatist religious groups, was a liberal cause every bit as much as it was a conservative one, and just as likely at the time to be expressed in the emergent progressive idioms of communitarianism and liberal multiculturalism, or more radical versions of multiculturalism, or the radical discourse of anti-colonialist critiques of Western liberalism and secularism. Indeed, support for the Sotmers has always been bipartisan, just as the Sotmer support for politicians, including the delivery of their much coveted block vote, has historically been bipartisan in return. Um, pictured here, you can see uh, two of the community's biggest supporters that can buy for the title of the biggest. Um, now, whether the, that bipartisan nature of Sotmer political behavior may now be beginning to change as indicated by the voting patterns in the most recent presidential election? Well, that's a question I'll hold off on. Perhaps we can talk about that in Q&A. Because before we can dissect what makes the political behavior of Sommer so very American, and what makes the village itself a quintessentially American phenomenon, we need to finish explaining what makes the village a shtetl and how it became one. As already mentioned, the Sama Rebbe had dreamed of creating a shtetl in the rural environs of New York City as early as the 1940s. It took decades, however, before his chief aides could find land outside the New York City, outside of New York City, whose residents were willing to sell it to them. It wasn't until 1972 that the Sama succeeded in purchasing land in the town of Monroe, which is about an hour's drive from New York City, a mission accomplished by using the subterfuge of a clean-shaven brother-in-law of one of the Rebbe's chief aides as the purchasing agent, so as to circumvent the local opposition to the prospect of, his, of Hasidim buying land that the Sommers had come to expect. Two years later, after the first construction projects were completed, the first residents from Brooklyn associated with the Sotmers began moving in. So at this point, the area where the Sotmers lived was just a neighborhood in the town of Monroe. It was not until 1977 that the area was formally incorporated as the village of Curious Joel. This event followed two years of intense tension over zoning issues. Far from being a plan all along, creating a separate village, exclusively populated and run by the Sotmers, was a solution to the zoning conflict devised by mutual agreement between the Sotmers and town officials. Indeed, the attitude of Monroe town officials and residents towards the Sotmers at this point was basically good riddance, as illustrated by the fact that the few non-Sotmers whose homes were originally included in the proposed boundary of the village demanded that the boundary line be redrawn. And so the village of Curious Joel was born. To give you a sense of what is so distinctive and, at least in the mythic sense, shtetl-like about this community, 
When you enter the village, as you are welcome to do, you will see the sign that you see here, which requests that people adhere to the community's norms of modesty. Now, lest anyone miss the point, uh, modesty in this context refers to norms of dress and gender segregation that reflect traditional sexual mores and gender norms. Carrie's Joel remains to this day, more than 45 years after its formation, an insular, exclusively somber community, no less homogeneous, no less devout, no less devoted to following the path of ancient Israel, as decreed by the Rebbe, and no less strict in its adherence to halacha. Indeed, in some regards, it's arguably even more stringent in its adherence to Jewish law, and even more resistant to innovation and integration into modern secular society than it was at the beginning. Because of its very high birth rate, the village essentially doubles in population almost every decade. Yiddish is the language, not just of the synagogues, but also of the streets, the stores, and above all, the schools, which, along with the family, are one of the most important areas of focus and investment in the community. Higher education and attendance at secular educational institutions is, to say the least, frowned upon, for the most part, simply not done, but virtually everyone attends traditional Jewish educational institutions, the Hagers, yeshivas, with the important exception of children with special needs who require a full-time special education program. So in all of these regards, I think we have to say the community's success in preserving the language and culture of its forebears is undeniable. So, in answer to the question of why we and others call Carius Joel a shtetl and what shtetl means in this context, it really just boils down to this. It is the town, the shtetl of Joel. <laughs> the shtetl that was envisaged by the founding Rebbe of the Somers, who imagined the shtetl not as it was, but as he wanted it to be. And as he was in the process of trying to make it be before the Holocaust a community that was more separated from Gentile society, more Haredi, more stringent in its observance of religious law, and more uniformly made up of followers of the Rebbe with his particular Hasidic vision of the way of ancient Israel. So the argument of our book is that this is a goal he likely could have achieved only in America. And that is why we call Curious Joel not just a shtetl, but an American shtetl, by which we mean both that Curious Joel and the shtetls of Europe have very different traits, and that the distinguishing traits of Curious Joel, its unprecedented degree of insularity, homogeneity, religious stringency, and political empowerment, are the product of the American system. Now, this is a deeply counterintuitive proposition that flies in the face of the widely held view that the village of Curious Joel is deeply un-American, that it flouts American values and American law. A perfect expression of which can be heard in this 60 Minutes expose. Let's hope this works. Imagine a town that excludes everyone except members of a particular religion. Certainly not in America. Well, guess again. There is such a town, and it's just 50 miles north of New York City. It's called Curious Joel. And virtually no one lives in the town except members of the Satmar Hasidim, a Jewish sect and a voting bloc that makes clear what it wants, and more often than not gets it come election time. Classic 60 minutes. Sounds pretty sinister. Um, so this is a perspective that was and remains widely shared, including by an interesting man by the name of Louis Grummet, who spent nearly 10 years suing to get a judicial declaration that a law that had been passed by the state of New York authorizing the creation of a separate public school district in Curious Joel 
is unconstitutional. On his view, and that of many liberal onlookers, conferring the powers of local government, in this case the powers of a public school district, on a religious community constitutes a fusion of political and religious authority that violates the principle of separation between religion and state. But while Grunet won his case when it went to the Supreme Court in, in uh, 1994, a very high profile event that thrust Curious Joel into the public spotlight, his preferred theory of the case that the law authorizing a separate school district for the Satmars violates the principle of separation between church and state did not win the day. To the contrary, the court expressly stated, it's an opinion authored by Justice Souter, if anyone remembers him, we do not disable a religiously homogeneous group from exercising political power. The court was emphatic about that, and that was a point of agreement between the majority and the dissent. Instead, a majority of the court coalesced around the view that the problem with the law was that it singled out one and only one religious community for this privilege, the clear implication being that if the legislature allowed every community with a similar need for its own separate public school system, that would be constitutional. And so that's exactly what the New York State Legislature proceeded to do. Immediately after the 1994 ruling striking down the original authorizing statute, the legislature passed another authorizing statute purporting to allow any small municipality that met certain neutral geographic and financial criteria to establish its own school district. When that was struck down on the grounds that it was really motivated by the same discriminatory intent to single out the Sommers for favor as evidenced by the fact that Curious Joel seemed to be the only area that could satisfy these neutral geographic and financial criteria, the legislature enacted a third statute. And when that was struck down, it passed a fourth. And it was really only because Grummet ran out of steam and ceased and desisted from his almost decade-long battle with the Curious Joel Public School District, really with the state of New York for authorizing this creation, that the litigation ended um, definitely with a whimper and not with a bang, and certainly without any definitive ruling on the constitutionality of the final authorizing statute. Instead, in the absence of further legal challenge, it was simply left to stand. Now what's important for explaining or defending our thesis about the Americanness of Curious Joel is the theory that I just alluded to embraced by the, the court in the Grunet litigation, according to which there's nothing wrong with the religious community having, establishing its own local government institutions, so long as that is achieved through the bottom-up mechanisms of private choice. As the court, this is actually uh, the dis dissenting opinion's language, but it was a point on which the majority and dissent agreed, so long as a geographic area just happened to be religiously homogeneous, meaning that it was a product of private choices about where to live and market forces uh, about where you get to live, uh, there's no constitutional bar to that population exercising its right to vote to create a local government. Now underlying this proposition is the fundamental idea that there is a sharp distinction between the public and private domain, and further, that the private domain, that is, the domain of private choice and private action, which on this conception is understood to include religious exercise as well as economic enterprise, needs to be protected from state action. So long as the forces determining the demography of a particular area are, from the standpoint of American law, private market forces a matter of private choice, as opposed to being dictated from the top down by the government, 
And so long as every community of private citizens or residents assembled by these private means has the same opportunity to establish its own local government, then laws that permit religious communities to engage in this kind of local self-determination are not in conflict with the prohibition on singling out religious groups for favor or disfavor. Now, at the time that the court was enunciating this proposition, this singling out theory, it's the 1990s, many people were writing about and becoming attracted to what was labeled the communitarian critique of liberalism, according to which liberalism, despite its purported neutrality and professed commitment to pluralism and the tolerance of diverse cultural and religious groups, is paradoxically intolerant because, the claim went, it has an atomizing, desiccative, destructive effect on traditional communities, and for that matter, on non-traditional communities that reject the elevation of individual rights over communal values and communal structures of authority precisely because of liberalism's commitment to protecting individual freedom of choice. But the argument of our book is that the story of Curious Joel's origins and ongoing existence shows that the very things that communitarians say will lead to the destruction of, a, of illiberal communities actually can serve as the building blocks for the establishment of communities that reject liberal values. The Sommer town began, and it could only have begun, with the ultimate free market act of acquiring land, purchasing land in the town of Murmur. Then the developers sold the residential units to property owners who in turn sold and rented them to other Sommers who came to dwell in the area that's now called, but wasn't yet, Curious Joel. Once a sufficient number were assembled, and all it takes under the laws of the state of New York is 500 residents, then they were able to vote to establish their own village as a subunit of the town. So <coughs> this process is what we call communitarianism from the bottom up, which follows a private pathway to the creation of not just thick communities, but an actual public square, a public entity. Indeed, some might even say to the creation of a religious establishment. But that's actually the question. Are the governmental entities that are created through this private pathway religious in nature, or are they secular as demanded by, or rather as some people say is demanded by the establishment clause of the Constitution? Now, this is a question that has been raised in multiple legal challenges that the village of Curious Joel has faced, of which there have been many. Indeed, there's so many, it's almost impossible to count. It took me years and years to identify them and unravel them and disaggregate them, which is a notable feature of the history of the community um, and a sign of its Americanization in and of itself, not only because, right, America is famously a, a highly legalized culture where everyone is always running to the law, um, but because the Sotmers profess to abide by the principle, by the halachic principle, that internal disputes should never be presented to Gentile courts. And indeed, the establishment of a robust network of rabbinical courts which adjudicate many of the Sommers' legal matters, in particular business disputes and matters of divorce and custody, is another of the shtetl-like features of the society that the Sommers have successfully managed to create. Nevertheless, this halachic principle that internal disputes should not be adjudicated by secular courts has been, shall we say, honored in the breach on so many occasions I could not begin to to even list them here. So for the sake of convenience, we can sort them into two different rounds of litigation. These are numbers two and three, one being the uh, 
litigation we've already discussed itself a 10-year course of litigation challenging the constitutionality of New York, the, the statutes uh, purporting to authorize the establishment of Curious Joel's own separate school district. So the first of these commenced at the same time as the Grummet litigation, and it continued episodically for over 20 years. I mean, it, it may still resurface. That's what's listed here as the KJ dissonance versus the KJ establishment. And then there was yet another, I can't even say round, because it, it in and of itself involved at least two long-running rounds of each including multiple lawsuits, um, which raged, and I do mean raged, between the years of 2001 and 2012. Both of these sets of litigation emanated out of internal political conflicts that arose inside the community, beginning with the death of the charismatic founding rabbi, Reb Yoilish, which occurred in 1979, not even two years after the village was formed. There had been no plan for succession. He had no male heirs. His three daughters, who would never have been considered for the position, predeceased him. And from the beginning, there were tensions when his nephew, Reb Moisha, assumed the mantle of leader and Rebbe, the new Rebbe of the Satmar community. Amongst those who opposed him was the widow of Rabbi Joel, known as Alta Thaida, who attracted a circle of followers who called themselves the B'nai Yol, the children of Joel, imagining themselves to be the true followers of Reb Title So that sort of roughly explains the parties to the number two here. Um, and then years later, these tensions would fan out into an even fiercer and more ossified split between Reb Moisha's two sons, Reb Aaron Teitelbaum, who Moisha appointed to be the chief rabbi of Curious Joel in 1984, and a younger son, Reb Zalman Loeb, whom he anointed as chief rabbi of the Williamsburg congregation in 1999. This is a point in time when his which his powers were fading, he will die about six or seven years later, 2006. Now, each of these lawsuits revolved around different issues, but at their core, they all came down to the same basic issue, to be sure, the succession dispute, but underlying that was the issue that had also proved to be central to the outcome of the, central, of the school district litigation. Was there a distinction in Curious Joel between its religious and secular institutions? And did it track the distinction drawn by American law between the private domain into which religious institutions and activities are supposed to fit and the public domain? That is the domain of governmental activity and the activities of places of public accommodation, which according to the prevailing interpretation of the Establishment Clause is supposed to be secular. Okay, this is a, we'll see if this works. To address, if not answer, because I'm not really gonna answer this question. And by the way, no court has ever definitively answered this question either. Let me try to be a little concrete. This, a schematic representation of the area in the town of Monroe, right? So, town of Monroe, that became the village of Curious Joel. It's now actually uh, known as the town of Palm Tree because in 2019, a new town was formally incorporated the town of Palm Tree. Palm Tree is the translation of Teitelbaum. Um, uh, and at that point, Curious Joel, which all these decades had been a subunit of the town of Monroe, seceded from Monroe and became a subunit of the new town of Palm Tree, whose Boundaries are coterminous with Curious Joel, although it was able to expand thanks to some annexation. But that's now, I want to go back to then. This is the way things looked, graphically speaking, before the Sommers made their purchase of land in 1972. Right? So up at the top, you see the town of Monroe, and you see the Monroe Woodbury School District, 
These are public entities, local government entities that pre-existed the arrival of the Somers. And everything else is empty. By the way, above the line is public, below the line is private. Um, and it's all empty because initially this is unsettled, undeveloped land. So the first entity that begins to fill up this space is a development company. Right? That's the company that purchases the land in this one relatively small portion of the town of Monroe. This is the company I mentioned before that was fronted by the clean-shaven, non sommer passing purchasing agent, but which is actually owned, run, funded, uh, controlled by sommer businessmen, lay leaders whose mission is to implement the Rebbe's vision. And so the development company does what development companies do. Having bought the land, it subdivides this land, it builds housing, and then it sells the land. So these represent, right, the O is for owners and R is for renters. So these are owners and renters who, who have bought or rented and moved in to uh, the property units that are continuously being uh, uh, developed to support the village's burgeoning population, although it isn't a village right away. It's initially just a neighborhood. The development company is also providing land for other important entities that are, from the standpoint of American law, private institutions. Right? Whether they are private from the standpoint of the Sotmers themselves is a different matter. Right? So, uh, uh, let's see if we can bring them up. Uh, the, the development company provides land uh, uh, for the synagogue. And what is the synagogue? It's a private corporation. Um, my dear colleague, Professor Gordon, can tell us all about the significance of religious congregations as private corporations. It's a congregation that's officially incorporated under the laws of the state of New York that govern nonprofit religious corporations. The development company is also providing land for, and then it sets about building and constructing schools. A boys' school, a yeshiva, a girls' school. Um, it, 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 it creates uh, the all-important cemetery where uh, not only our community members buried, but the Rebbe is buried there. This is a sacred site, a site of pilgrimage, control over access, and the ability to exclude is a critically important uh, private uh, uh, measure. All of these are, from the standpoint of American law, private entities. And there are many other private associations that fill in this space, uh, many of which are, are offshoots of the congregation. Uh, we talked earlier about the community's modesty norms, who enforces the modesty norms which were so fundamental to the Rebbe's vision of a Torah true way of life, well, there's a modesty committee, right? And there are other committees, the most important of which is the Vad HaKiria. That's Yiddish for the village committee, which many regard as the single most powerful entity in the village. By the way, it's not clear if there's actually any distinction between the Vad HaKiria and the development company. If I had the means, I'd like right now Make, make that big circle and the littler one kind of move towards each other and maybe, maybe not merge. They certainly have overlapping personnel. They share the same mission, which is to acquire and develop land and to allocate the housing that is built on the, on the land under their uh, direction um, uh, and which the village leaders are in the constant process of acquiring and developing. So, it's only once the community is assembled in, in the private sphere that we see the creation of Curious Joel, right? The village, which consists of a village board of trustees, that's like a town council, um, a mayor, a deputy mayor, a village clerk. By the way, all of these offices, the, the office holders have, have, have been in these offices since the village was founded in 1977 until the present day, um, with one exception I'll explain in a moment. And the municipality 
you know, and these, these, these village officials, they do the things that municipalities do, collecting garbage, providing sewage, uh, establishing a building department. Um, it takes them a while to do that. That doesn't happen until the 1990s, um, but they establish a building department to enforce its building and zoning codes. Other typical local government agencies performing other typical local government functions. To round up the picture, um, there's also a public housing authority, which is technically a federal agency, but federal law dictates that local leaders be appointed to the board of the local public housing agency. Um, and, then, and then we also have the school district in Curious Joel, the subject of contention in the Bremen litigation that was established in 1990 for the specific purpose of providing special educational services to sovereign children with special needs. Okay, let's put a face on these institutions. Um, if we begin, as the village in fact historically began, with leadership in the private domain, right, below the line, well, at the tippity top, you have the Rebbe, or rather the Rebbe's successor, right? The original Rebbe dies in 1979, so this is Reb Moisha, who's actually, he's based in Williamsburg, um, but he is regarded as the ultimate authority, except by <laughs> those who oppose him. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so we have the Rebbe, um, and then uh, in uh, the mid-90s, uh, as mentioned before, Moshe appoints his oldest son, Aaron, to be the chief rabbi, just of Curious Joel. So Moshe remains the rabbi for all the Somers, but he decides to make Aaron uh, the chief rabbi of Curious Joel. And that means that Aaron, he's, that means he's the head of the congregation, um, and he also occupies uh, the position, what's called the Rosh Yeshiva. He's the head of the private school system. Um, there are also lay leaders who I've referred to earlier who play extremely important roles. Uh, there's a board of the congregation and a president of the board and a vice president of the board. These are lay leaders um, amongst whom the most prominent is a man by the name of Abe Weider, who for many years, decades, rotated between the positions of, vice, of president and vice president of the board of the congregation. So he and another guy took turns. Um, upon the creation of the village, hold that thought, he, he um, actually becomes the deputy mayor of the village. Um, another man, by, you can see here, Lefkowitz, uh, next to, to Mayor, um, Leopold Lefkowitz is one of the great elders, one of the original lay leaders of the community. Um, he too is really based in Brooklyn. Um, so he is the titular mayor. He's elected, but he's been sort of chosen uh, uh, by the, the Rebbe. Um, and it's understood from the beginning that He's the figurehead, and um, a leader uh, who, for a long time, until until um, uh, left Goetz's death in 1999, he's formally the deputy mayor. But the understanding and arrangement is he's really going to be functionally the mayor. Um, in fact, uh, uh, leader is is <laughs> so in control of things um, that uh, local journalists oftentimes would refer to him uh, jokingly as boss Weeder. Um, uh, Weeder also is elected to the Curious Joel Board of Education <laughs> when it's um, first established. Um, uh, and then you have a village clerk, a very interesting and important figure by the name of Gedalia Zegedin who has a hand in just about everything. Um, he's the nephew of Ma a man by the name of Meyer Hirsch. You might have seen his name in the papers, even recently. Who's Meyer Hirsch? He's a very, very successful businessman, a major power broker and benefactor of the community who runs the development company and the Vodha Kiryat. 
<laughs> which may or may not be the same thing as the development company, um, and, but he's the guy who plays a leading role in um, determining how private housing is distributed. Um, he also is, or at least was for a time, on the board of the Public Housing Authority, so that meant he was also in charge of determining how public housing and public housing subsidies would be distributed. And when the village got around to creating its building department in 1995, who gets appointed to run the building department and who uses his newfound powers as head of the department to deny the dissidents a permit for the construction of their own synagogue? Well, that would be Meyer Hirsch. So the question that all of this raises, and this is really the question um, that I want to present to you, not answer, present, is A, whether the boundary lines between public and private, secular and religious activities and authority are being blurred, are they? And B, if they are, is there anything wrong with that constitutionally? morally or legally. Now again, I want to remind you, this is a question the courts have avoided answering, notwithstanding it's being presented to multiple courts on multiple occasions, nowhere more vigorously than in the myriad lawsuits filed by the so-called dissidents, that is, the folks who are opposed to Rev. Aaron, and before he died, they were also opposed to Rev. Moshe. As opposed as they were to Rev. Aaron, the dissidents, as they are referred to, the sovereign dissidents inside Carius Joel, were, and they remain to this day, equally opposed to the village officials, who they regard as working hand in hand with the leaders of the community's religious institutions. I mean, of course, as with a leader, oftentimes hand in hand, but they're the same person. Um, uh, uh, and using those conjoint public and private powers to penalize them, to penalize the, dis the dissidents. And beyond their allegations that they are being subjected to discriminatory denials of zoning permits and other benefits like tax exemptions and access to public housing, the dissidents maintain that to exercise the, the powers of secular government to hold these offices, even if they're not discriminating against the dissidents, or penalizing them, that this is a violation of the Rebbe's quietest theology, according to which exercising the powers of government is an inherently corrupt and inherently secular activity that Jews must renounce in order to remain spiritually pure. That was a core element, although not the only element, of his critique of Zionism. So from their point of view, the very existence of the village is a sacrilege that violates the Rebbe's classically quietist theology. So it might seem rather paradoxical that they turned to secular courts and sought to invoke its secular powers of law enforcement to vindicate this quietist theology against the village. Um, but that is exactly what they did in the um, numerous lawsuits that they brought. And I have to say in 1997, they actually at least appeared to come quite close to persuading a judge, the judge happened to be the newly appointed Jed Rakoff, for those of you for whom that name means something. Um, and they, they seemed to come close to persuading Judge Rakoff that the village is, in their lawyer's words, a theocracy whose operation and very existence violates the Establishment Clause and the principle of separation of church and state. We don't know for sure if Judge Rakoff would have ruled in support of this proposition because the dissidents agreed to settle their dispute with the village, which was at its heart uh, a just fairly sort of pedestrian dispute, but not great political implications, over a stock order um, on the conversion of a residential building into a synagogue, which the defendants village officials agreed to live as their part of the settlement. All subsequent attempts to get the courts to address this issue, and there have been many, have been met by Judge Rakoff and other judges to whom these subsequent lawsuits have been prevented, 
presented with the same re refrain, race judicata. This dispute has already been adjudicated. You can't reopen and relitigate a dispute you agreed to settle. But the question remains, and it's really, I think, a question for us as much as it is a question for the courts. Is the fact that village officials are responsive to the wishes of a religiously homogeneous populace and to the directives of the religious leadership clearly an indication of the creation of a religious establishment, albeit from the bottom up? Or is it reflective of the democratic nature of the village, which after all, is supposed to represent the interests of its constituents. Does the principle of separation between church and state require that voters and the officials who represent them forswear consulting their religious beliefs when they make political decisions? If so, then civil rights leaders who advocated for legal reforms, civil rights laws on the basis of their rel religious convictions in legislatures and government officials who effectuated those religious convictions uh, likewise would have to be condemned and civil rights laws overturned. So these kinds of considerations have led most people who have considered the subject, and I see some of them in this room, to conclude that the mere existence of religious convictions or the mere coincidence of religious convictions with the values embodied in a law or other form of state action cannot alone disqualify the holder of such convictions from exercising the franchise or running for office or exercising power in ways that accord with their convictions. On the other hand, it would seem that some line must be drawn lest the wall of separation between religion and state collapse altogether. Of course, there is a school of thought and a mobilized political movement dedicated to advancing the school of thought, according to which the principle of separation between religion and state, requiring the removal of religion from the public sphere, sphere should be rejected. That it's a mistaken interpretation of the Constitution. And that, indeed, has been one of the major agendas of the religious right, which is to say the Christian right, um, but which some Orthodox Jewish organizations have supported. In hindsight, we can see the 1994 decision in the Grummet School District case as having played a pivotal role in that campaign. But, but it was not quite a turning point. I think it's better to see it as a kind of crucial midpoint in the religious rights campaign to get the Supreme Court to overturn its decisions upholding the principle of church-state separation. And to that end, the village's legal defense in the Grumman case, uh, it bears mention, was enthusiastically supported by what was then the newly ascendant Christian right, many amicus briefs filed on their behalf. Um, the religious right didn't succeed in that campaign in 1994, but the Grumman case was an important way station in the evolution of an increasingly conservative approach to the interpretation of the First Amendment, which in the Supreme Court's last term, we saw, if not quite fully culminating, at least coming very, very close to repudiating the principle of separation between church and state. Now, again, it bears emphasis, it was not only conservatives who paved the way for this retreat from a principle of strict separation and towards greater tolerance and even more affirmative forms of support for religious groups, including separatist ones like the Sommers. Um, I'm going to leave with that, um, but if I can, if I cannot, um, I was going to end with a slide alluding to recent events that will get up on the screen momentarily, I hope. Um, but um, I'm going to close there, um, and I'd be very happy to address comments and questions. Final slide. Recent events. Discuss. All right, so the second code word is society. Uh, and so the first one.
Um, questions? Comments? So does this include Curious Joe or is this just Brooklyn? So this is an article. <laughs> I would, have, I would have given a little description if I could have gotten the slide up earlier. So as you correctly note, this was the first in a series of what I think is now four articles, investigative journalism by the New York Times, which is focused on Brooklyn. Um, but uh, the Sommer community, as I've already mentioned, straddles Brooklyn and Curious Joel. And as I've alluded to very briefly, um, uh, you know, why, why was a public school district created in Curious Joel? Um, the reasons that led to its creation are very connected to what's going on in the yeshivas in Brooklyn, which are the source of current controversy. Namely, what to do about children, sophomore children, children in other parochial school systems who have special needs and require and are legally entitled to special educational services. Indeed, public school districts are legally obligated, there's no discretion, it's not the discretion of the parent or the child or anyone else, um, legally they are obligated to find diagnose, evaluate, and then provide an appropriate individualized educational program for every child in the district who has special needs regardless of whether they attend public school or a private school, be it religious or non-religious, or are homeschooled. And that has created a very intractable dilemma. That dilemma is really what led to the creation of public school district in Curious Joel, which in turn led to the litigation that I just finished describing. Um, it never would have happened in the absence of this special education law. Um, so the issues are connected, although obviously, you know, that was the, that, you know, that was the 80s and 90s. Um, things have evolved both in um, the Brooklyn-based community and in Curious Joel and other suburban communities with regard to special education. Yeah. Um, when you were doing this research, did you come across any maybe Christian communities, like extreme Christian sects that have similar issues as Curious Joel? Yes. Um, sure. So this fits into a, a long history of religious associations, religious experimentation, uh, religious enclave communities, um, many of which, if not the preponderance of which, have been Christian or Christian offshoots. Right, that was an interesting question. Again, we have an expert in the room. Whether we're Mormons Christian, um, uh, oftentimes sort of unorthodox from the standpoint of establishment Christians, forms of Christianity or other religious groups. And so first of all, right, Curious Joel, its characteristics are in unprecedented in the history of Jewish communities, but full of precedent in the history <laughs> of America, right? That's part of the reason why this is very American. There's nothing unusual about this. There's lots of communities. And it's not only, you know, uh, what's the term they use? High intensity, intensive, or you know, very insular uh, uh, religious sort of enclavist communities that uh, uh, exist um, and uh, have some of this, some issues similar to Curious Joel. There's a much much broader swath of you know, if we're going to talk about this issue in particular. Um, there are lots of people who are parts of religious communities um, who are very committed to sending their children to religious schools. Um, uh, and that's, that's uh, an issue for people of many, many different faiths and many degrees of insularity. Um, but the last thing I'll say in response to your question 
Um, you know, there's what people, parents, are trying to achieve for their kids, right or wrong. Um, and then there are movements, highly mobilized political movements. By, you know, so there, there is a movement that I've alluded to, the Christian right, sometimes referred to as the new Christian right, and it's not a homogenous movement, it has many different elements. And, um, but there is at least a wing of the Christian right movement today um, that is really eagerly observing and publicly expressing its support for uh, 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 the Hasidic and the larger Haredi community in Brooklyn and beyond, um, and taking a much more extreme position than the Hasidim themselves have publicly taken. Namely, right, there's an extreme faction. Right? There's actually one group very clever at co-opting the language of the left. Um, the most extreme wing of this Christian right um, wants complete and total deregulation of religious schools and homeschooling. Coupled with public funding, right, for religious education and homeschooling. And let's not stop there. Defunding and abolishing public schools. So that's a movement. That is a, an important factor. And it's hard to know how fringe that is. You know, Betsy Boss, Betsy DeVos, was that her vision? How many notches over? So that's a really important part of what is going on today. I mean, not to mention understanding how newly appointed and some of the longer um, term conservative justices in the Supreme Court would respond to those arguments. Yes? What bothers me is that the welfare of the kids are not considered at all. As a New York Times article, I, I only read the first one, pointed out these kids get out of school and are not equipped to deal with the modern world. Um, the the um, Amish were allowed to pull their kids out of school, I think at 14. So the kids are the, uh, the education of the kids ceases to be important. Only the beliefs of the parents uh, are the only things that count. And I, it seems to me that has to be addressed somehow. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're making, I'm going to try to disaggregate three points in what you just said. Um, one is you're calling attention at the end of your remarks to a very powerful um, parental rights notion, which is also part of uh, it, it's not only the religious right or conservatives who, in, who um, uh, uphold the idea of parental rights. That's um, in many ways um, the work of Dorothy Roberts on the faculty here could be seen as um, really appealing to a notion of parental rights um, as a bulwark against uh, what she sees as a really racist child welfare system. And my dear friend and colleague, Ann Daly, um, is about to publish an article on really a critique of parental rights in which she observes that this is a kind of mantra um, uh, that, that is um, to be found on both the, the right and the left ends of the political spectrum, serving different objectives. But what it has in common, as you say, is that it prioritizes the rights of parents um, in a way that would seem to eclipse what we might call the rights or the interests, or as you said in the first of your remarks, the welfare of children. So that's point one. Point two, do they, I'm not sure who they is, they could be, um, uh, uh, the leaders of uh, uh, the Haredi community um, who are responsible for 
uh, whittling down the amount of secular education in yeshivas to almost zero. They might be parents who choose this form of education, who don't want their kids to receive the secular education, although there are, it's hard to know what the percentages are, there are a considerable number of parents in the community, stakeholders in the community, they don't want to leave the community, but they think that um, they, 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 they object, they want more secular education. And in point of fact, <laughs> right, if we go back to the early history of this community in the United States, the early days of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, when the Rebbe, the original Rebbe, was first creating the, the school system, he was adamant that it had to include more than a modicum of secular education because he was adamant, right, unlike some other uh, Haredi communities, uh, he absolutely did not think that um, men should spend all of their time studying. He, he, he thought people, men in particular, uh, needed to work for a living, needed to make a livelihood. They should study before they went to work. They should study at the end of the day, but not during the day, and they needed to be able to get jobs, and so it was very important to him. And the original curriculum had more in the way of secular content than it does today. And that's one of the things I was alluding to when I said, in many ways, the community is more stringent and more resistant to integration into secular society than it was in the early days. And partly for that reason, yeah, you know, there are many members of the community who think it's totally consistent with the Satmar way of life to have more secular education. The last thing I want to address, right, so that, you know, who they don't care about the welfare of their children. I has a, you know, that's a very broad statement. Um, most people, most actors, if not all, believe they're acting in the, in the interests of children. People just have different conceptions of what is in the interest of children. Um, so, but I thank you for that, that question. So, yeah, so, so I, Ben? I, I, the powers that be have told me that I have to, that, that we should adjourn to the hall, but Naomi's gonna be around, and please uh, let us thank her and we can chat with us.